Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. I am your host, Jason Miles, and this is something we do like to do on the weekends where we have these cross-collaboration episodes with other shows that we like. Sorry, let me move this out of the way. Since we have such a packed house, let me hurry up and get into the introductions of who's here from the This Is Revolution team. Let me introduce my co-host, my homie, my dog. He is the man of the Mau Mau Hour, the Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, Jason's Mizza Mizza Miles. Uh, we, we don't see our good friend Marcus here yet. I don't know what happened to Marcus. Marcus went for Jamaican beef patties. Oh, well, in the absence of Marcus, we do have one of the co-hosts of our Foreign Policy Thursdays. You know him as the supreme leader of Death Star Middle Management. He is Deep State Cuba. Oh, what? oh, what a disappointment. That's not Deep mm-hmm. State Kubo, that's that Slick Back Hair Gene. <laughs> slick Back Gene. That would be a good name. Dead in Devlet. The Deep State. The Turkish Deep State. Biz Anker and Biz. You're confusing our audience. You're confusing our audience, Gene. If you do the whole show speaking nothing but Kurdish, that's the funniest thing. That ever. was that was Turkish, but yeah, I could do the whole show. Can you do Push the whole show in Kurdish? In Turkish, I could do the whole show in Turkish. Hoş geldiniz, yoldaşlar. Please Biz don't. devrim içinde hazırız. I feel that's like nice, my mom all kinds of whores. No, I would never say something like that. That's ayıp. That's forbidden. Yeah. That's shame. You know, ayıp. Call someone's mom uh, a whore. Yeah, that's a big shame in the Middle East. That's how you get stabbed. <laughs> it's also how you get stabbed in the hood. See, we have cultural connections. Solidarity. Solidarity. You get stabbed if you call so- if you say something about someone's mama in the Middle East. That's like a death sentence. Also Again, called- very similar to the hood. Speaking of the hood, we have uh, our favorite uh, black man that was in the frosty suburbs of maine and now he is in the chocolatey city of northern virginia he is marcus of the left flank bets what 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 did i come into and i gotta ask gene did is 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 cuba wearing you is cuba wearing a jean suit he might be Cuba's like Ken the doll. Like he, his the the clothes are like molded onto him. He has like molded on underpants. I thought you meant he's like Ken the doll because he has no genitals. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about that, but Cuba's like a Ken doll. He has no penis. <laughs> it's all smooth down there. <laughs> that's what they do to you in the deep state. That's how they, <laughs> that's how they, that's how they get make sure you don't fall for compromise. They like well your Now that you're tight. working here, you won't be needing these. Snip, snip. <laughs> snip, snip. Well, I think I see the real general leader of the Death Star Middle Management. He's always firing the guy that's supposed to shoot the gun in the Death Star. He is Steve State Cuba. General. You know, um, Saddam and Stalin had doubles, so I figured, right, like, if it's good enough for them, I should work on one myself. I don't think the gene model is quite right, because um, Cuba's it talks like five, back. Cuba, Cuba's but, like um, ten inches taller than me, too. <laughs> so you're like a me? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, I thought you guys were both auditioning. Cuba and Manuba. I thought you guys were both auditioning for Men in Black or something. That's all I was wondering. Minute, minute, minute. Oh, Black Men like and Men in Black. Like, are you the bootleg? Are you the bootleg made in uh, Iraqistan, Cuba? Yeah. <laughs> they, don't make, they, they don't make any. They don't make anything in Iraqistan. So no. 
yeah, it, it's made Stanley. in China, but for the Iraqistani market. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I got I, I got some I got some made in China wheezies from the market in in, in Suleimania. I got all, uh, but they fell to pieces. I got Spider Man shoes. I had all these great shoes. Mm. I love bootleg stuff. Oh yeah, bootleg Turkish Spider Man is a classic, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I almost, I actually almost bought a. a bootleg ohio state jersey when he had gone to i think we we're in uae we had stopped in port there but the logo the ohio state logo that's in like the center of the chest was upside down <laughs> sacrilege <laughs> nope can't do it i i have a little collection of pictures i've taken in various parts of the, of the world with bootleg toys that don't match and i love it i think it's the most amazing thing ever you can get in Iraq. One thing that's very popular is Hitler T-shirts. Weird. Big Hitler fans. Yes. Big, big, yes. big Hitler fans. There is even there is even there was a Kurdish guy, and I don't know if this is true. He named his kids. He named his kids Hitler and Stalin. And when someone asked him why did you call your kids Hitler and Stalin, it was like because they are strong men, strong men, and they're always fighting each other. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's bring in the American Prestige Boys. Uh, American Prestige is a podcast about the United States and the friends it made along the way. It's hosted by Derek Davison, a foreign policy analyst. I can't talk right now. Analyst and Daniel Bessner, associate professor in international studies. Daniel Bessner is also a friend of show that has been on a couple times where we get to shit all over Barack Obama whenever he comes on. So we will not be Barack Obama shitting today. He is not going to be the topic of discussion, but let's bring in Derek and Daniel, double D's for a double dose of this pimp. Derek and Daniel from American Prestige. Hey guys, hey guys, thanks for having us. And 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 the Hitler conversation reminds me, Derek, you might remember this in 2018. There was that Peruvian election that pitted a guy named Hitler after a guy named Lenin. Do you remember this? <laughs> This is real. I'll put, um, I'll put it put it in the chat. You, oh, yeah, you're, you're yeah. going to have to remind, refresh my memory. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. It was like a whole thing. And there was a famous, I think it was an Argentinian, like, like military leader who was named something, something similar like Hitler Stalin. It's like a thing that, that yeah. happened in, in reactionary countries in the 60s and the 70s, particularly uh, anti-communist um, countries did, did like a, a Hitler uh name funnily enough um i forget it was a very famous thing i'll try to find it but yeah hey guys thanks for having us no problem it is all yeah, good. there he is there, there it is there it is the good hitler the good wins hitler. mayoral seat over <laughs> lenin in peruvian <laughs> district there you go history I mean, i'll take a enough. bad lenin over a good hitler any day you, and in the soviet <laughs> union a big name was um marlin for marx lenin that was a big name in the 70s and 80s as well. Um, is that who Marlon Wayans is named after? No, yes. that's a, that's with an O. <laughs> <laughs> that was a in there was a there was a sectarian communist group from Iraq that basically moved to the UK, and it basically collapsed because that big policy thing when they moved to the UK was to have sexual freedom, which sounded like a good idea when you were in the mountains of Iraq. But was not so. Basically, all the guys were like, "Hey, we all need to have sexual freedom." But they all discovered that their wives were actually way more successful at having sexual freedom in London than they were. And I just remember there was a, there was this guy who's you know uh, was very depressed because his wife was like having sexual a lot of sexual freedom and he was not having a lot of sexual freedom. And his kids were called Marx and uh, Mark. Marx and Angles, not not Carl and Frederick, Marx and Angles. So these poor Iraqi kids in London called with the first name Marx and the first name Angles, whose basically dad was a depressed cuck. <laughs> That's a true story. No. Work a Communist Party. <laughs> work work a Communist Party of Iraq. It was a it was like a really crazy, crazy cult. Yeah, if that's the beginning we'll... of a good leftist organization, I don't know what is. <laughs> We will have well, sexual we're, freedom in Europe. We're, we're here today to talk today. about the declining empire that is America. We have, we are one of the richest nations in the world, but we were the worst prepared to handle COVID because we have such a horrible public health infrastructure, wealth inequality at crazy feudal 
Beetle level. Oh, excuse me. Level. I can't talk right now. Levels. Follies overseas. Is the empire over, fellas? Way to cheer me up, dude. <laughs> is it? Is, is this what we're I mean, that, that does seem like something that would cheer you up, actually. Yeah. So I'm oh. gonna. Uh, sorry, Pascal. Please. Besnay, my man <laughs> Besnay with the beignets. I want to chime in and say, uh, <laughs> it ain't over till the fat lady sings. Is she not singing right now? I, I passed an overweight woman singing as I went and got my coffee this morning. Mm. Apparently, you guys didn't see that the bipartisan infrastructure bill got passed. So um, I don't know how <laughs> you yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Pump your brakes. Pump your brakes. Because I posted an article late last night. The one point X two or three trillion dollar bill or the the republic trillion the republic bill with the progressive bill the republic just just the just the bipartisan deal just the republican yeah, no, yeah. Well, don't don't yeah. pump the, the that's not the bill back better the bill back better part is to combine them both yeah he didn't say that yeah he said the no, no 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 yeah. Yeah, like, yeah 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 hold on, hold on. well that's why i mean obviously we need to be pragmatic in our expectations okay we need oh, so to... what you're saying is the bill that's going to be the upward, uh, the wealth transfer upward to the construction and development industry in real estate industry in the United States is the they without, need help too, with, Pascal. Without <laughs> they need without help. Corporations are people. Don't you remember without that? Without any, the bill Pascal, without any... Pascal, you just don't care about people. Like there are hardworking people in the in the landlord sector. There are hardworking <laughs> people in the health insurance sector. You know, that is a hard selfish, working person. Selfish kind of thinking that leftists always have that they they never think of the consequences. And that's why you guys always lose. That's why oh, you're the right. working people, the working people. Yeah, fuck them, but, man. But electric but Monsieur, car charges. That's what the Monsieur, working people need. Monsieur Bezna, uh, what were you gonna say? You uh, do you do you agree? Is America doomed? Um, well, this is what I was going to say. Yes and no. Uh, when we're talking about geopolitics, I actually think this thing could basically go on indefinitely. Um, I think the creation of the all volunteer force and the, the you know ever increasing technologization of war, which has been going on pretty much since war began, um, indicate that you actually don't need that many people uh, to run this thing. And it's so disconnected from any form of democratic politics. You could kind of just maintain the bases indefinitely. Um, so you could even have something like a gen general collapse at home. I, mean, I don't think a total collapse, but I don't think that's on the table. Some sort of general collapse at home and the empire broad um, keeps on functioning. Uh, so I think that that is, you know, kind of complicating the American decline. I think it's clear that, you know, domestically and socially and, and by all all those indicators, things are not not going great, to say the least. But, uh, you know, uh, unlike Britain or unlike Rome, where you actually need people to, you know, govern particular places abroad, the U.S. empire never relied on that. So you could have a lot of the imper imperial functioning. You could have dollar hegemony. You could have military hegemony pretty much indefinitely i think and so that's the uh, unique thing about our our historical moment um so i just wanted to lay that out there as sort of the base of my position i don't know if derek agrees or not um well i would i mean i would like to add you know, as we're talking about the the uh, the companies that that need our help right now we we should be thinking about defense contractors some of whom lost you know tens of millions of dollars a year when we pulled out of afghanistan so i mean let's <laughs> let's be cognizant of, of the losses moment of silence, are, say, moment of silence for the defense industry took that major golf courses of all over the caymans are taking a huge hit right now that's Tommy the, Bahama exactly stock right is plummeting yeah i mean some, some i mean the, the third third I lived, have like, their allowances the reduced yeah it's it's bad i mean people are people are struggling you got uh, you know ceos of raytheon out there with the you know, I looking for their next rent check. I have a question for our two guests. Uh, it's not like there hasn't been a crisis of capitalism before that people predicted as being the end of empire or the fall of America. This has happened before. And what happened before to kind of jig it up, juice it up, was that we went into a global conflagration called World War II. And the question I have because I, my firm, my firm belief is that uh, empires are the sorest losers in the world, and if they go down, they're taking all the marbles, their cards, their toys, with them, and we'll leave you with nothing. 
So my position is that before American Empire lets itself goes down, they will smoke everyone <laughs> before they live. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind uh, of agree. Yeah, I don't know, Derek. I, I mean, this is part of the reason. I, I agree with Danny broadly on this. That I, I, I don't think the Empire is going anywhere. Um, I think what you're going to see is a retrenchment in some places, some uh, particular spots of the world, like East Asia, I think, you know, China is clearly uh, on the ascendance and, and the United States is going in the other direction. But overall, uh, as long as the United States retains the capacity to destroy the planet, which we, we will never give up, um, the, the empire probably isn't going anywhere. And as, as Danny alluded to, the, the more we're able to fine tune this machine and make it almost automated at this point but certainly we've we've refined it to the point where the a impact of maintaining uh, this massive military doesn't really fall on that many people anymore um you know there's there's no general uh, military conscription we don't even really fight uh, conflicts with a, a large number of troops anymore we've kind of uh, refined that down to special forces and uh, mercenaries, contractors, um, we're moving even further in the direction of uh, drones and other, you know, totally automated weapon systems. Um, so I, I, you know, the 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 less painful it becomes, uh, the you know, the, the more we develop these technologies, the less painful it becomes for us to to maintain this. But kind do of we power. not? We don't really have a historical reference, though, recent times of what it would look like to have a mostly private military occupying different parts of the world. Um, no one here on this panel thinks that's going to have some frightening effects. I think it would, but I also think that the the power elite don't care. I understand that, and but... I, I would say like we're we're probably closer than that than not. Um, and to compare to is like when um, so Vietnam Vietnam era, we're you're looking at fifty to one service members to contractors. Um, and now that that ratio has completely been reversed. So now we're seeing two contractors for every one service member. Um, and this goes from everything from like food and um, just basic infrastructures of a base to like targeting, you know, having actual, uh, you know, like missions and, and everything like that. Um, where yeah, you'll have a bunch of uh, special forces maybe spearheading the effort to give it like actual like legitimacy, but the most of the troops around those special forces are are, are just contractors, you know, like fucking Eric Prince. And let's be clear, this is not just an American tendency. We've seen the Russians deploy these right. private no, contractors. Absolutely right. Yes. And thing and Turkey, Turkey. You know, people don't think about this, but Turkey basically its projection of of military power over the last five years has been through Syrian mercenaries and private contractors. So this model is a model that is exportable. And I think as as Daniel and uh, uh, Derek pointed out, because of the nature of the technology, you can insulate the population. Like one of the things I always say is like, one of the things the left should push for is conscription because then the weight of warfare is felt by the entire society. One of the most deleterious effects of the Bush era was the fact that the cost of the war being fought in Iraq and in Afghanistan was completely divorced from the realities of Americans. So you did not have the same kind of anti-war movement that developed in the context of Vietnam. It was so, it a different time, though, as well? I mean, yes, it's a different time. But like the, the fact was, like if you're a university student who's about to get conscripted and sent off to Vietnam, that's a big difference from when it's like, Maybe I'll join the army. Deferment. Well, let's be honest. Yeah. You were getting a deferment and you weren't going anyway. But also, um, I think that the move towards mercenaries is in some ways the neoliberalization of Absolutely. proxy tendencies that were there in the late Cold yeah. War. Right. Yeah. The um, American conflicts in Africa and um, Central America especially were fought by local proxies and now instead of going to ideological parties or different local groups aligned with the goals of uh, imperialism you just buy it on the market somebody 
found an opportunity and then they filled it. Well, I think it's really interesting because this particular phenomenon actually represents the, the sort of strange blend we find ourselves in. I think, Kuba, you're 100% right. It's neoliberalization. But of course, almost all of these soldiers are initially trained by the nation state based American military. So what you effectively had is the blending. Um, and I think this is we on the left. We, we're not analytically good at this. I've been saying this for years now, but someone needs to really do a major book that examines how sort of the nation state based security apparatus interacts with with international capitalism and i think this is a particular phenomenon of that where you have basically the minor leagues of the special forces are the are the uh, official the uniform military as we say and then some of you know the best ones graduate to becoming mercenaries um so there's they're not totally disconnected from the american state they actually reflect the fact that the american state since 1945 has been this strange conglomeration agglomeration rather of public and private right where we essentially outsource our foreign policy thinking to think tanks you know there's no like there's no rand corporation within the uh, official state um so you have this strange public private melding that is basically being seen in every aspect of our lives and as it is usually the security aspect is the last to be felt because security is essentially considered the sine qua non of a state going back to Weber, you know, the organized monopoly of violence. Um, so, but we're seeing it now. We're seeing like the apex of neoliberalism. So I just wanted to point that like, um, that out. makes a very interesting and important point. I, to, I'd like to kind of contemplate a little bit more here is that neoliberalism is actually a project that starts in the military industrial complex and then shifts in, overall into American public society, generally, particularly uh, after the New Deal Civil Rights Coalition kind of collapsed with the rise of Nixonian kind of, uh, you know, the Bretton Woods, all that other stuff we all know about and going on to the, Vol the Volcker shot and the think tank Rand Corporation and the privatization of geopolitical planning is kind of the early forecast of the neoliberalism, neoliberalism that is to come. It's actually a, a nice little uh, analysis that I've never really thought about, Bester, so I give you props for that. Well, but I want to, I want to, I want to complicate the narrative because I don't believe American empire is going down. I think that what will happen is that we're going to move in the direction of Britain in the sense that we're going to be a one part, a one party nation. And that one party nation will be the Republicans. I think the Democrats are done. I don't, I don't even want to waste my time in terms of getting into that. It's going to move to the reactionary role. Right. And I think they will be belligerent. And I think that they will try to start a military conflagration with, with China uh, as I've stated many times, Rand, Rand Corporation already has a white paper they published in 2016, War with China. I definitely see something that ha happening. You don't have to get into how that will turn out in the end. But my position is that we won't necessarily see a collapse of empire. But I do believe the internal social fabric and mechanism of American society may collapse. In other words... I don't think it's going to be a hard collapse like 1929. It's all over because, frankly, my position is that uh, the, the we we're, we're print print we're printing money to save capitalism right now. Quantitative e quantitative easing, the Federal Reserve, the central banks are what's keeping capitalism functioning. Companies, the only reason why their stocks are profitable is because they're doing massive stock buybacks. When you have fictitious investment mechanisms like. Bitcoin and cryptocurrency that are churning, that are literally Ponzi schemes, that are churning millions of dollars into the economy. I believe that we've we reached into a position right now in capitalism where it is so dis, dislodged from practical economic reality when you can create something like an NFT and make it a tradable item that they will literally manufacture something or anything to keep this thing going. And if it does get bad, they might throw in a, either a little Keynesianism. If they get a little desperate, they'll even throw in some social democracy. But it will be done from the right, not from the left, because the Democrats and liberals are done. But what I do see is not the hard collapse of American empire. I see the internal social collapse of American society that will become much more uh, stressful and distasteful for Americans. I see much more conflict. I see much more, con I think that with the retrenchment against voting rights, I think regardless, I don't care what we don't have to have a debate when we think about it, all types of notions of uh, racial policy of redistribution, and it's not redistribution, it's racial democracy, affirmative action, minority set aside, all of, all of that stuff that came out of the 60s, which created 
a black middle class and women women in corporations because let's make this clear the greatest beneficiaries of affirmative action in america are white women that's a fact it's undebatable but to oh, let me finish, let me finish you. so what i see is that <laughs> combine that with the crisis of masculinity discourse or the retrenchment against all of those policies is going to eviscerate certain middle classes particularly uh middle classes of color particularly the black middle class you're going to start to see women getting seriously seriously challenged in corporate and educational positions and on the ter- in the terms of this wokeness stuff will start to go away less women will be in positions of power as well and the social fabric of america is going to become much more antagonistic there will be more poverty and depending on how generous the reactionary right will be they may kick in some social democracy expanded social welfare state to keep it going i actually believe we are at a point where the right will be more willing to give us some form of social democracy than the democrats in the left and it will be a miserable country that will still be an empire but it will still be going keep going what do you think the right's going to give as far as social democracy when you have these companies like zillow owning you know tens of thousands of houses throughout the country i think a ubi was something that they wouldn't have a problem with the they also, out in California. They, they might they might pay women to stay at home and look after children. Yeah. That's a classic sort of Christian democratic socialism from the left um, approach. But there's one big piece that I think we're missing in this conversation to sort of complicate it even further. It's not just a question of America, whether or not American imperialism an empire can continue. You have to think about what other powers and other countries are going to do and how they're going to react to the behavior that we've seen so far from, uh, you know, basically ever since George uh, W. Bush, the leadership of the United States as a hegemon has been in question, um, even among countries that have done well out of the Cold War American led order. And also what the adversaries of the United States um, are willing and able to do to push back the opportunities that they can capitalize on and putting aside the diplomatic and political side of the international environment there's also the question of how much does the U.S. imperial machine rely on the international economy and to what extent can it be hollowed out by things like supply chain crises um, limited you know having access denied to semiconductors and semi-finished uh, technological goods um, rare earth metals strategic minerals things like that and i think that these are areas where the vapidity of american empire potentially hits a hard reality check and that's how you get a recalibration of america's role in the world forced on it by economic or international political reality. What do you I think, think uh, the, the, the supplies, the supplies, the, the Cuba hits on another very important point, right? There are certain structural realities in the COVID, post COVID environment that create a crisis of capitalism that I don't think was uh, foreseen, which is inflation. Because now that we have these massive inability to get goods and services to people because of the supply chain problem, we got we have for the first time in what 40 years we have a potential inflationary crisis in the united states now i think that capital is creative enough where they're going to find a way to remedy that and keep the system going by printing money to create a creating new uh uh vehicles to get goods and services transport in other words the supply chain problem is a perfect example of when what's naomi klein's theory of uh when there's a crisis disaster shock doctrine disaster yeah shock doctrine in other words this the, the crisis of the supply chain right now causing inflation is actually a potential shock doctrine moment where capital can see this as a me as a means of a job creation program finance it and do it in a way to actually save capital and save and save capitalism and I think, quite frankly, it will be done by the right. Because I don't believe that the liberals or the left have the credibility. Because you know why? The right doesn't care about getting tagged with economic chaos. 
only liberals are insecure about that. Why? Because the tag of being financially irresponsible is always tagged to liberals. What are your thoughts, Derek? Um, well, I think I mean I think Kuba makes a, a a good point about the supply chain and about the the dependence really that the United States has um, on China to a large extent for for things like uh, rare earth yes. minerals for semiconductors. This is one of the reasons why um, I don't envision a war with China happening anytime soon because the economies of those two countries uh, are so intertwined. And this is one of the things that I push back against. Uh, when when you get people talking about the new Cold War and, and you know this uh, this sort of framework, uh, it, it's it's m much different than the conflict with the Soviet Union was because the U.S. and China are so tightly bound together economically, um, you can't sort of uh, separate them into competing camps like this. And I think the potential for uh, the U.S. military to lose access to semiconductors, to lose access uh, to rare earth metals in the event of a conflict with China is one of the things that will keep us uh, from entering a conflict like that. Now, what it also means, probably moving forward, uh, is that you will see, in addition to one of the, the things I think is going to be big, a big problem globally, uh, you know, in the coming decades, uh, low, sort of regional conflicts over things like water and migration. Uh, as climate change kicks in uh one of the other drivers of conflict and it may not be a, like a hot conflict but a uh, sort of low level conflict will be the competition for these scarce resources to funnel into the the military and to make sure that we can uh, maintain technological dominance so that will that will you know mean uh, greater competition, sometimes violent in Africa, in uh, in parts of Latin America where you know uh, where rare earth minerals predominate, and and, and uh, you know it will also mean funneling probably uh, money into building a, a, a semiconductor industry that is uh, outside of Chinese control. Let's say. And one thing that uh, I think brings together the neoliberal element of military privatization and the role of the large contractors in the defense apparatus as well as the dependence on china is the extent to which the when you have privatized your r d functions when you have privatized uh coding for um software that's essential to military or intelligence operations when you've privatized things like um the F-35 program and a gajillion different sub, sub, sub contractors are all feeding into it um, with a lot of the talent pool that they need to draw on being um, based in East Asia or um, East Asians that are trained in the West. I think that in any conflict with China, it would very quickly become apparent that a lot of the F-35s came pre-hacked, that a lot of the technology that the United States is depending on to fight China because they lost control over the process by incorporating so many private companies into it. They have also lost the integrity of those systems and the, uh, they'll discover that the technology is uh, unreliable, like that China already knows how to counter it and in many cases might just uh, be able to take over or uh, render assets inoperable I mean, but that will come say, out in the regional conflicts where um the peers that are able to fight inter, uh, informational um and cyber war uh don't care and it's more important for them to conceal their capabilities rather than um, intervene intervene in you know what the united states might do in somalia or ethiopia or sudan i, I like my the only the only th there's one silver lining here my argument, and I do believe that reactionary right is going to take hold and do try to do all these things. But my argument thing is the silver lining is this. I think that if the right fails badly in terms of their management, and this their, their management could last three presidential cycles, four, eight, 12 years. Right? It can be a while. If they fail miserably, with or without a global conflagration, badly, I think that in that social instability, there will be so much potential chaos. You're going to see riots. You're going to see urban rebellions. You're going to see cops. You know, there'll be so much instability. Let's say, for example, if their failure to maintain the system is economic in nature. 
another another COVID crisis or an economic crash, something, some you know derivatives. No one's been talking about derivatives for years. That that monster is still out there. Derivatives could crash if they fail you, badly enough. I don't think anyone is going to be interested in giving the neoliberal demo, traditional Democrats any credence anymore. But I think that that will be the opportunity for something to the left of the, new, the the actual Democrats that could be, you know, progressives or social Democrats to possibly move America to the left. What I'm saying is that it will take a massive failure of the right wing authoritarian project before this country is going to but be able to let, have. Let me ask on the left. Pa Pascal, let me ask this question to the panel then. Sorry, this is a question to everybody in the panel then. Didn't we see the massive failure with COVID and then the ensuing protests that happened pretty much all over the country? Who Daniel, got, who, Daniel your, 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 your sound is off. Sorry about that. Guys, I think this is really crucial. And this is like my major take on today. I think that what we have is a, is a big contradiction. We have the institutions of mass democracy. We have mass political parties. We have the mass media. We have um, mass protests, you know, thinking of that as an institution in the broad sense. Um, but however, uh, the, the way power actually functions is totally unrelated to any of these mass institutions. Um, I think the, the U.S. state has very effectively carved itself a space totally outside of democratic politics um, in, in basically every issue area. So you could have massive protests, um, the, the George uh, anti uh, the murder of George Floyd protests, you, you go back, you could have anti-Iraq war protests. But the problem is that these are just not meaningfully connected to how power actually operates in this country. So this is the big disconnect and why I think everyone's going a little insane is you have all these events that seem political that in previous decades probably would have been political in the sense that they affect what's going on with power. However, we are there's nothing um, to affect this sort of power. And in, not only that, we have these new forms of technology, these social media things that make us feel like we're affecting the discourse, that this is a meaningful public sphere. We talk about nothing but fucking politics. I agree. There's absolutely no connection between our talk or even our mass political actions and politics. So neoliberalism, defined here very broadly as sort of the individuation of everything, has affected politics ourselves. So that's why we're, we're in this insane world where we talk about nothing but politics we have things that seem political and then nothing ever changes and so this is the fundamental contradiction of our age which presents an enormous problem to the left because everything we do is premised on mass politics but what if mass politics actually have no relationship to power and i think that is my empirical um normative understanding of where we are today I would, well, uh, I, I, would, I, would Daniel, Daniel, I agree I agree with you 100% that there is a mistake especially in the internet world where people mistake an audience for a movement yeah but, but my argument is premised on the fact that I don't think that the left comes back because they are organizing in the streets I'm saying the collapse will be so bad and the desperation will be so bad that people will be demanding some kind of option otherwise after the right takes control i'm not i'm not saying that there's going to be a movement and you know what i'm saying is that there's going to be social dislocation in america when the right takes power so much of it is going to be garbage because it's going to be online digital crap so and i agree with you the george ford protest went nowhere it's not like the 1920s and 30s where you had a million working class people but, but shut down hold, hold on but when we talk about the george floyd protest we always have to put it in context that it's not simply because of george floyd a lot of things go go into that protest. The lockdown, first and foremost, is a right. big reason why. A, a, a hatred for Donald Trump is a big reason Absolutely. why. Absolutely. George Floyd wasn't even the only person that died, I think, in that month that was big time news at that time. He like just Brianna gets to be Taylor. Brianna Taylor, Taylor Ahmaud Arbery right before that. He just gets to be the, the, the face oh, so. of this frustration. To me, what it was was America's frustration with the failure of institutions in general. And to Daniel's point, and even to Pascal's point, I think that's why the protest went nowhere because it was just, ah, and that's ultimately what it was. And when people tried to act like they were, we're gonna talk about this next Thursday on the show with a reporter that's been covering Minnesota, when people were trying to really lean into defunding
contacting the police and the city council responded with empty rhetoric. Nothing happened in Minneapolis to defund or get rid of the police like they said they were going to do. And since then, it's not like more people are out in the street. They're not burning down more police stations. So, no, I agree with with the whole uh, disconnect from a real movement. My question is, as we constantly see the failures of these institutions, and I understand power kind of doesn't care, at what point do we get a bunch of rebellions not like George Floyd and maybe even more violent. And that's what I'm seeing because one thing that I do see living in California and in working with the unhoused is the growing population of homelessness. And there was one of the guys that lived in the studio that had taken pictures over a five year period of how large the homeless camp had gotten. And it went from four little tiny houses where the New York Times used to come every so often and interview the fucking architect that built the tiny houses for the little homeless lady and her dog in the rain uh, to over 200 people in an encampment to the level that some people had fucking mailboxes on their encampment. And all the city did to shut up the business owners and the people was they put like a freeway rail there so people would stop hitting the 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 ramshackle houses and a porta potty. I mean, well, I think I think this is an extreme. I think I mean I want to sort of circle back to something Daniel uh, said about the way that the American state has kind of created an uh, an armor around itself so that it is not really affected by popular uh, protests and popular politics. Because when we look at George Floyd and what happened, the outcome of those protests was that the Democratic Party actually wanted to spend more money on police. And if we look at the crisis that takes place uh, in capitalism, every institution it seems to be in le- you know losing legitimacy. Yet, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, the key organizational forces uh, of the American state, uh, are stronger than ever. They, the, the, the abil- their ability to weather this crisis is extremely powerful. And in some respects, you know, the, again, this is the contradiction, you know, uh, yeah, like the online world has helped sort of uh, rebuild socialism as something that people at least talk about. But, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of, you know, talking about politics online. And I know we're doing this and I know we have podcasts and stuff like that. But it's like, you know, watching porno and thinking you're a thinking you're a pickup artist, right? It's <laughs> it's, it's, it's 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 a it's a, a it's become a vehicle through which discontent can become commodified and sold and integrated into the capitalist system. So it, it's it's frustrating because the old methodologies of politics that uh, Daniel uh, mentioned, you know, don't seem to be working in this real circumstance. Now, Pascal talks about a possible future of, of, of a collapse, which yes, that may happen. But I think at the end of the day, you know, how one weathers that collapse, even if the authoritarian right completely fails, uh, is gonna depend on, you know, concrete or organizational base of the left and how and- they how they overcome how how they overcome the political terrain that has emerged in the internet age and how they learn uh, to deal with it. And I want to make one fi- final point, which uh, comes back to the the war with China thing. I don't think we're going to end up with this huge war in China, partly for the reasons uh, that Cuba and Derek outlined in terms of the supply chain structures. This is not a repeat of like World War, you know, 1914. It's a different global system. There are nuclear weapons. Uh, I think, yes, proxy wars and things like that are more realistic. But I think another factor is that the American bourgeoisie, you know, if we think of it as a class, is divided on the China issue because there are the commercial wing of the, the, the American ruling class wants to make deals with China. And the military industrial complex, in so far, there may be, there are maybe elements of it that wants war with China, but there are also cynical af- uh, elements of it who like they maybe don't really want a war with China. But the rhetoric of war with China is a good way to extract wealth from this uh, from the population in order to right. purchase more useless weapons. So I think that I think there's a lot of uh, you know I think the type of conflicts we might see in the future are very much what happened in Syria where you have private mercenary forces being involved, proxy wars and things like that, where where there are kind of rules of the enga- engagement uh, uh, and, and not these big front wars, because the cost of those wars 
uh, are just going to be too great for the ruling classes to contemplate. So that I think we'll be, you know, in a pre-nuclear weapons age, you can like envisage conquering a, a country. In a nuclear, when when your opponent has nuclear weapons, right? You're not going to invade them. North Korea is like, you know, does all kinds of batshit crazy stuff. No one's talking about invading North Korea. Why? Because they have nuclear weapons. And North Korea is tiny. So, you know, if you look at someone like China, you know, no one's good. I, do, I just, I find it, we are not anywhere near the mode of global complication. But I do think, as Derek and, 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 and Daniel have pointed out, we're going to be seeing a lot more of these Syria type wars taking place across Africa with local players. Like when we look at the conflict that's taking place in Ethiopia today, I mean, people can weave a big imperialist story behind it, but the big drivers behind that is Egypt, which has its own national security reasons. I agree with that. It's to, to yeah. think. So we're going to have this like chaotic, uh, we're going to have these fortresses of stability surrounded by these chaotic, uh, 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 proxy wars and failed states i mean i mean gene there's a there's a point here you're bringing i'm glad you mentioned africa is that we can have a war with china but not on china's territory we can have a war with china in africa and uh, the there's something that i wanted to talk about that ties in some of the elements that we've been discussing things like the privatization and the insulation of the military industrial complex from mass politics and from other and from general social and economic forces inside the United States. And uh, Pascal was talking about the possibility that you have, and as well as Jason, uh, uprisings or other kinds of uh, disturbances that might come about as a result of further decay within the United States. The There are a couple of things here that I, I wanna flag. One is that the left is very weak, like. Daniel mentioned on defense analysis and security issues. Um, it's also weak inside the security apparatus. You don't have leftist police departments. You don't have leftist military units. You don't have, um, you know, a squadron of of uh, helicopter pilots that would defect in case of uh, an uprising. And if there are disturbances that really shake the American order, the advantage in a time period of crisis goes to people who already have training, access to weapons, already have organizational skills and familiarity and comfort with violence. And that's on the right. The, this is going to be successors to um, elements of the security apparatus, internal and military. Um, of the United States, as well as right-wing groups that uh, obsess over uh, military and militia issues. So if there is a general disturbance in the United States where that monopoly of violence is challenged, and it could very well come in the form of the bourgeois and the elite pulling back into defensive enclaves and letting a Brazil-type situation occur in the rest of the country where they're not going to bother to police it unless it affects uh, their areas. Um, that, while, you know, that anarchic, that unstable, that sort of insecure environment will favor rightists um, when the, if violence comes to be an issue. And the left, if it, if we're serious about this, if this is a future that we want to prepare for, needs to either make inroads into the security apparatus of the state so that you do have police departments or military units that can defect, or it needs to start building up its own defensive uh, capability for when um, it's open season on... Uh, what do you think, uh, I Daniel? Make, I want to make a brief, a brief point because I don't want to be misread in terms of what I'm saying. I'm not saying that movements of protest against the reactionary right will either be effective or not be crushed while they're in power. I'm saying the movements won't happen while the right is in power. And if they do, they will crush them easily. I'm saying movements would happen if the right completely collapses and fails miserably during its one party rule. Then I think there will be movements from disaffected people, even within their own cadre, to demand something different. Now, that and I told you that all of my prognostications are 
are all hinged on the right failing. What I actually do believe is that the right may not fail because I also believe that the right will be more willing to implement social democracy than the liberals and the left to maintain their hegemony. Do you, do you they consider... have, if you read that, if you read the uh, the the, uh, the statement from the set, John Josh Hawley from Gene State of Missouri, where he's talking about the crisis, I mean, the crisis of masculinity. We've talked about this a million times. The porn that is, is too good. That is going to be a global rallying cry of the right, and it already is, and it's going to work. So the, the, the interesting I, question, well, hold, hold on, both both guys. Let's put a pin in that. We we have two guys here uh, from American Prestige. Can we get the, the double Ds, double dose of this pimpin? to uh, address what Pascal is trying to say oh so passionately? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start very briefly and then I'll, I'll hand it over to my man, Derek. Uh, well, I think broadly speaking, we've been in a period of leftist decline for over a hundred years and that the big moment when we could have created a new society was before World War I. Um, I actually talk about that on, on this new podcast I'm doing with Matt Chrisman Hingepoint. So if you want more of that take, you could go on. But I just don't see, to, to speak to Cuba's point, I just don't see any sort of, you know, um, Zapatista-esque movement coalescing or even and certainly not succeeding. I, I just think that when you look at revolutionary situations, um, they're so uh, like it's such an extreme social collapse. Like if you look at 1917 Russia or 1918, 1919 Germany or the various um, decolonial revolutions that have occurred after 1945, I mean, it's such an extreme social collapse that I don't think we're anywhere near in the United States. Um, so I, I don't think that'll happen. I, I think that's actually um, reflected in, in, you know, what happened on January 6th. Like that was the closest we came. And that was basically, I think a joke. Um, you know, as disturbing as it was to some people, I don't think that was anywhere near, you know, QAnon shaman getting in charge of an aircraft carrier. Um, and I think that the American state is so, so powerful that it would essentially um, stamp anything that challenges uh, it like that in a, in a meaningful way. Um, what you could see, but it's interesting, we might want to discuss why we haven't seen is something akin to what happened between 1890 and 1914, where you get hundreds of European aristocrats, the, the nobility um, killed. But to me, that's really just the final period on the bourgeois revolution that was begun by the French Revolution. It's interesting that we haven't seen those sorts of stochastic violence um, events in the United States in any meaningful way. There was a Steve Scalise, I believe that was his name, um, mm -hmm. assassination attempt. But that's one. And if you compare it to previous historical periods, that's just very little. Just compare. Can, I ask, can I ask a quick question then? About sure. Yeah, yeah. So the question I have is like, isn't the fundamental difference that, you know, when we talk about the rising violence in the late 19th century in America, but also across the world. It's, I'm thinking across the world. Yeah, across the world where we have like, you know, uh, you know, assassinating American presidents, you know, bomb attempts on the Ottoman Sultan. Yeah. The you know, SRs like, from Russia. Yeah. Sure, all, of all this kind of stuff. Isn't the fundamental difference actually that back then there wasn't cheap food and playstation today exactly. there's cheap food and playstation which and is fentanyl well, and drugs we, i think we, you're going to see like the legalization of sex work i think you're going to see stuff like that increasingly uh, these types of opiates that that just to keep the population at bay we have cheap food we have cheap drugs we have cheap sex and we have cheap video games and distractions Euthanized that is a big difference Dan daniel and Derek, but would you Derek, sorry you should go Dude, again, this question is for both of you guys. But what do you think about? We're, we're talking, you know, turn of the century revolutions. Let's talk more so modern day, eighties Philippines. It took them years, and they had January six like coup attempts that seemed funny until shit got real. So, and now you look at the Philippines with Duterte in power. This is a movement that takes years to happen uh philippines a very weak state i mean like it's just not comparable meaningfully in my opinion to what the american state is it has is able to do and it has done i just wanted to make one addition to my final point about the josh holly statement about the masculinity and this this is why i believe that the right will implement social democracy what's less in, what's more interesting than his obviously plea to a male insecurities particularly white male but it's going to be cross-racial because a lot of black and brown men are buying into it is that he one of the remedies he's he's saying is social democratic reform give people money 
to have families and have babies. Give people money to stop watching video games and porn and create jobs for men so they can work and be production. I don't think that productive, that's not irrelevant to me. And what I do believe is that to preserve their hegemony and empire, because no one's going to call them socialists and no one's going to call them lefties. No one's going to see, they're going to be using the, we're doing this to save American capitalism stick. And, and they I mean, they're be, already they're, called white supremacists and it isn't hurting them. So right. and, and <laughs> one, of the, the th one of the things I find fascinating watching people like Peterson, even uh, um, uh, what's the guy from, from Louisiana, the, uh, the, the right wing, the all right guy, what's his name? Uh, so I, well, I forgot to say, I found it fascinating after Biden won how many of them, as much as they talk about all oh, the Marxists and socialists, all of them started incorporating rhetoric about the importance of social democratic type programs to ameliorate the suffering of people, of their people. Like, yes, we need to have I mean, jobs Donald Trump did the same thing when he was on the campaign trail. Derek, would you like to chime in? Pascal's talking too much. <laughs> no, he's dropping some some good stuff. So look, uh, man, we you know, brought you white means. guys on here because <laughs> whenever black guys talk, white people go, "Are you guys talking about black shit?" And it's wait, not wait, wait. Is this thing <laughs> that the <laughs> white guys aren't good enough. So we need white guys Ooh, on here, yeah, and actually. then the black guy can talk. <laughs> I mean, I view a lot of these questions of collapse and, and sort of what's coming down the road increasingly through uh, the lens of climate change, which uh, brings its own crises, but it's also a multiplier of all the things that we're talking about here. It makes inequality worse. It makes displacement and homelessness worse. Uh, it makes uh, conflict worse. We've talked about the potential for conflicts over things like uh, rare earth minerals or semiconductors but what we're looking at is a future of conflicts over things like water um you know i, I you guys mentioned ethiopia uh, egypt's interest in ethiopia is partly fueled by water because of the the grand ethiopian renaissance dam and uh, the impact that they're afraid that may have on the nile we're seeing border clashes in central asia not fueled by governments by people who are struggling to uh, f you know, struggling over control of water resources. Uh, lakes are major lakes are drying up in Turkey. Major rivers are drying up in South America, uh, completely drying up, destroying entire sort of ways of life and ecosystems. Uh, the 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 con the possibility of a conflict not between the U.S. and China, but between India and China over aquifers in the Himalayas is, is looming larger and larger every time they have a border con you know sort of border clash. Um, and and I, I feel like when we talk about collapse uh, over the next over the rest of this century, what we're going to be talking about is not the collapse of political systems or the collapse of left or right. It's going to be the collapse of the basic systems on which people rely to survive. It's going to be questions of where's the food at? Not not food prices are too high, but where is the food? We can't grow it in places that we used to grow it before. Where's the water coming from? Where am I going to get the next glass of water to uh, drink? The road um, situation? The movie The Road? Yes. <laughs> I guess, well, this yeah. is, I mean, this I is what this be is... as sudden as all that, but it, it, it it's we're already seeing this, this stuff happening. Okay. And to be to be sure, the United States is the last place that's going to really be affected by this. Exactly. Or even the United States and like Western Europe are the last places where, where uh, you know, this is these impacts are really going to hit. But they will come. They will eventually hit. Um, and and it's, it's going to be, I think, through the collapse of these basic systems and the need for people to work together just to survive day to day that is going to have uh, the, the greatest impact on, um, you know, what our politics to the extent that, that you think of that as politics uh and look like by let's say 2100 i just want to add something this. yeah i was going to add i was going to add this is this is literally what the syrian civil war was about you know the syrian right. civil war was driven by climate change i remember in the in the years leading up to the syrian civil war the the, the conditions in syria were so bad that the nomadic uh, groups were bringing their uh, animals to iraqi kurdistan it was like a big deal at the time. The tribes were bringing their animals to, to, to Iraqi Kurdistan to, to have uh, uh, water and food. And 
the question is going to be, and there's a great book called, uh, called The General Crisis about which talks about the you know 17th and 18th century and the environmental change, is that society there were societies that had political structures that allowed them to weather that crisis better than others. Japan was a good example of a society that was able to weather the the climate change that took place uh, in the uh, 17th and 18th century better than, for example, Western Europe, which was a bloodbath, right? Or the Ottoman yeah. Empire, which basically imploded. And I think, I think you know, the Syria obviously there's the 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 economic base for the Syrian conflict was this environmental crisis and drought that was affecting Syria exacerbated by Turkey's damning policies and things like that. But what made it worse and aggravated it was the political system and the sectarian system that, you know, made the stakes uh, worse. So, you know, it, it it really is, to Derek's point, we're going to have a question of hey. socialism or barbarism, you know. Is well, it and it's not, not just Syria. I mean, the entire yeah. Arab Spring and really was fueled in part by climate change and then sort of the the knock-on effect as these revolutions took place but i would add to that another place that we you know is where we see environmental impacts feeling conflict there the the entire sort of sahelian band across africa right now is increasingly uh sort of the the locus of conflict between groups that are predominantly herding societies and predominantly farming societies who are being shoved closer and closer together on smaller and smaller amounts of arable land with uh, fewer and fewer water resources. And, and it's and, one of the, the things that multiplies conflict in, in, in that region. And while the band of uh, territory that is ecologically strained to such a point that conflict can emerge might be limited at the moment, the effects of these types of resource scarcities and the conflict that goes around with it is refugee flows that move not from the uh, conflict zone to the most convenient place, but often, you know, if you're going to be a stateless refugee, go to Europe. Or if you're in Central America, go to the United States because there are resources there uh, in greater abundance where you could potentially uh, find a uh, refuge and start a new life. And those refugee movements, when they become large enough, then become destabilizing um, phenomena of their own and become uh, the vehicle through which that localized ecological catastrophe becomes a regional or global um, security issue. And I'm not just, and I'm not blaming the refugees. Uh, one of the uh, Gene pointed out that in periods of crisis, the political structures, social structures, the economic structures of societies determine how vulnerable they are to it. Well, one way that you can be, uh, you can resist this type of instability is you shoot all the refugees. You don't allow anyone in. Another is you allow people in and you have systems to assimilate them. You have systems to settle them. Now, whether you might have an able state in the sense that you're capable of responding. But then if the society um, doesn't have uh, enough coherence to decide, OK, we're going to invest in accommodation or we're going to invest in um, exclusion. You that political cleavage becomes a vehicle for that instability to reach the core. I, I, I think Coop is making a very important point. In terms of the environmental factor, particularly the water, I think that what our guest is saying is right on point, but I'll be very frank. The American ruling class and the European ruling class won't care because I'll be very honest. The only thing they will care about is the refugees. If those black and brown people die, they'll see that as an advantage because they can go in and take their resources and not have to fight them. So that's not going to motivate the ruling class. The only thing that's going to motivate, motivate them is the fear of the ret refugee crisis. And the debate will be, do we just kill them or we just create structures? Or will they have them be the new underclass in our society? But uh, the motivation of, I don't, that, that's why I think believing that climate change is going to be the pivot that causes the ruling class to wake up. I don't think that's going to be the case. I think they're going to try to monetize it, new, green new jobs and all that shtick. But I don't think it's. I don't think they're going to really seriously take it, take it seriously, particularly if it's coming from the reactionary right. And they're going to be like, if those people die, that's great. That means we don't have to fight for the resources. Green New Deal is a hashtag. And, and so what we're, also I think what we're talking about that they're dying, right? 
the they didn't look after their environment. They didn't have the same economic policies. You know, they're not sending their best. They're drug dealers. They're rapists. They're Muslim. And of course, they're black, black and brown. Right. Well, but this will be applied to um, Ukrainians and Belarus and um, white ethnics as well. What, what were you going to say, Daniel? Sorry. Oh, no, no, it's OK. I mean, I think just this conversation, it, it just shows that we are, are just in a in a in a world where the working class didn't become conscious of itself, <laughs> you know, and like basically what, what do we do with that reality? Uh, and uh, I, I don't know. You know, I, I really don't know. It just seems like a, a bunch of shitty options that are kind of equally shitty. There's not even a less shitty option, really. And I think this is why we're all going insane. Like the, the 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 hope was that Bernie would you know maybe lighten the the neck, uh, you know the boot on the neck of the of the working class at least in this country, uh, and that didn't happen. So I think there's just this despairing tone to everything we're talking about because there's really nothing to do absent that fundamental historical thing that Marx said was supposed to happen and didn't. Derek, you, uh, Derek, do you have anything more positive to say? Perhaps like that was a pretty heavy down. Hold, Derek, Derek, hold on. Can you can you hold on for one second? Uh, Gene made a mistake in because he doesn't see me here, so he was trying to run the show because he's got a tie on. He doesn't understand that uh, the white guys have talked too long because we have a white guy talking meter, and it goes over. And Cuba interrupted Daniel and. Cuba didn't get the memo that two white guys can't interrupt each other unless it's white on white violence. It's white on white violence. Oh my God, I'm sorry. I violated white solidarity. You did. (laughs) So someone said this in the chat, and before I let Marcus make his point, someone said this in the chat, and I really need Daniel and Derek to do this because these are the white men that could do this as a joke. You guys are hearing it first. It would be a joke, but I think these guys could actually get it published because they can have serious white faces that would make people think they're being serious. Uh, Anglo pessimism. <laughs> I think you need to start a theory on Anglo pessimism and really lean in to being serious about it. And it will be the biggest inside joke you've ever seen. That's some Andy uh, Kaufman level shit right now. <laughs> With Derek, are you Wanda. Irish? You're Irish, right, Derek? I'm I'm a whole bunch of things, mostly German. I'm I'm sort of like oh, mostly German. Uh, Joe okay. Biden in that I'm probably mostly German, but I I, I like to Irish. highlight a little bit of Irish that I have. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Daniel? Where are your folks from? Oh, Jewish Russia, the Pale. Oh, the, the Pale. pale. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. U- Western Ukraine, Brest, Brestlitovsk, back back in the day, 1700s. Uh, so a German Europe. and a Jew leaning into Anglo pessimism <laughs> is going to be the greatest nice. thing to happen to academia. <laughs> It's a- Anglo excellence. <laughs> I think so, well, Marcus. there's a lot of things that like uh, we've like kind of hit on that. Um, a, I think like there's, there's, it deals with like any type of like um, military intervention or military operations with China. I think like mostly like Mike is going to like this is going to something that's going to happen off of any mainland for like either of these countries and i think africa is a, the uh, is, is is probably a solid fucking option um but at the end of the day even with like the technology that allows this military to the military to 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 function as it does now is actually somewhat separated from the conductor conduct conduction of warfare itself um and like the f-35 the littoral combat ship where they made six of them and then discontinued them already you know these are ex- hugely expensive projects that do expand the military industrial complex like more of economy but don't actually do anything to to expand warfare capabilities and i think like you get like the up to like the drone drone program you know that that, that gives them some actual like uh extra uh, extra movement but as far as like the the, the f-35 largely ineffectual to this day as anything that's like helpful operationally um and like with that there's like it's 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 mostly the complex that's now driving itself you know it comes from the neoliberalism of these like different think tanks and saying no these are the things that we need and i think like one of the last uh military um programs 
that was after built off of like, hey, what do the actual people on the ground need? It was like the A10 Warthog, you know, built decades and decades ago, um, which they're actually like trying to completely push out. Um, going to Cuba's point though of like anything that would actually have to be able to push back would actually need some <laughs> some large <laughs> large scale military equipment. And I, I, I agree, like that's where I think like, you know, when Pascal's talking about the inter tearing of the social fabric um i think the left has a very small fucking chance to possibly get into some positions in which you would have some military apparatus and i think uh you know a governorship in which case the uh, um, national guard would be you know and I, with that though it's like assuming too that most of the people who operate under that state would have the same mentality as the voting populace that elects said governor um and minnesota going back to minnesota um there's a continued push though you know with like pushing back against uh police <laughs> the police violence the like, the structure of the police department um and it was another loss right not to go back into the doomerism um but there was a uh a referendum to get rid of the police department and initiate a public safety department that did fail um but the people who were behind that movement, you know, like really did, a, I think, did a good job of a, recognizing where, why it did fail, recognizing that certain campaigns that were levied to the to, entire to city it. council said they were on board. How does that fail when the entire city council says they're on board? It was, a, it was, it was, a, you know, the people were voting for it. It was, a, you know, it was like a, and that's where too of like, like the, yeah, it was like a public referendum. I mean, the the headlines of the LA Times today, Daniel. I don't know if you saw the LA Times this morning. Is that uh, one of the schools in Los Angeles that uh, defunded their police? They had police in the schools. They said they want the police back in the schools. Really? Not, where was it? Where was the school? It's somewhere in SoCal. I'll, I'll let me look where. Um, I, not I in the city, though. Not in LA. It's not like Glendale or something. <laughs> no, <laughs> there is no, there is no, no police cops in, in Glendale. In um, just, just Armenian revolutionaries. I mean, uh, Pomona, P Pomona, Pomona. I didn't know there was police in schools in Pomona. I did not know Pomona was that bad. I, don't I would teach Pomona. at Pomona. Gene, that'd be a pretty sweet job, right? Pomona College. Yeah, why not? Like uh, near the beach. I mean, yeah, I mean, I can't, I beach. can't complain about Missouri, you know. But you know, I love. Oh, you I can. Love... <laughs> you choose not. To. I mean, I always say, as someone that went to a high school uh, outside of where I grew up without police in my school, I was able to do things that normal kids do, like get in fights and cut class and yell at teachers and not get a prison record so police in schools is a very frightening thing in my opinion because my friends it's horrible it's horrible it's, 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 it's yeah. truly insane yeah. it's so all over florida like the, baby all over florida does the nypd have a special like school unit they do right they did yeah they did they got rid of that okay i, I, I that. thought they reallocated funds a lot of that shit was the, you know we all know this it's the moving around of money um but, uh, you know, I was just bringing that up because, again, we're going to have Marcus. You're more than welcome to come on the show Thursday if you like. We're going to actually going to have uh, a journalist who's been covering uh, Minneapolis for years. And he's been watching our show <laughs> and kind of likes the discourse we have around uh, defund the police because there is kind of a media perception of what really is happening uh, and what is really happening on the ground. And as we're seeing, and Pascal talks about this all the time, is that people that live in these crime-ridden areas don't necessarily want their police departments defunded and eric adams winning mayor in new york on a very strong uh ticket of tough on crime let's bring back stop and frisk again la times did a great article on how people without cars they can't afford cars usually uh uh, uh immigrants um are getting stopped and questioned on bicycles so the sheriff's department i believe was like 80 five percent of their stops were people on bicycles mm. just because they were riding a bike i mean think about that and, and daniel you live down south in la in, a, in an area where they're constantly making more freaking bike lanes because <laughs> they want people to ride bikes you're telling me that you're criminalizing certain people that are riding bikes yeah funny well, how that uh, happens what 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 a shock <laughs> no one could have predicted one thing, that one 
one thing that Matt Taibbi did really well in his book on Eric Garner is uh, point out the profit center motivation, the transformation of police into revenue generating organizations and how it serves as another point of extraction, um, even more racist and even more exploitative than what goes on in the private economy because police deliberately target uh, the people they consider to be the most vulnerable when they need to hit their quota of infractions, tickets and fines. Well, you know what the solution is. I, I came up with the solution to the, the police problem and the gang problem and everything. What we need to do is we need to adopt the policies of the Sunni awakening policy in Iraq, and we need to basically pay the gangs uh, to become the security force and give them and all to jobs. Kill Shia. And to kill, yeah, like uh, to set up, set up, a, set up a, a gang militia uh, in. Uh, I, I'm telling you, that's going to be like that's where the policy is going to end. You know, like yeah. they're going to have a woke version of that where it's going to be we're going to like yeah, pay. Yeah, there's there's going to be a crip IPO. <laughs> yeah, they had a version of that in Haiti. You know what they call it? The Tonto Makut. Didn't work out too well. Yeah, but it's a good way to 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 at least get the gangs to shoot the people that the government wants them to. <laughs> yeah, or you could end up with um, you know, Jamaica situation where you've got the rival gangs just supporting the rival parties and just them, you know, going back and forth. Uh, you know, there's, there's, can you imagine the Democratic issue. Party militia? It's going to be like all blue hat, like. Uh, uh, <laughs> You know, like the Democratic no, Party the de militia. That's that's. I think that's 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 the false flag, though. The Democratic Party militia is going to be, you know, mostly of like the Karens. You know, and uh, like that's Damn. that's just Ugg boots and Starbucks cups. Yes. Yep. Are you, yep. are you ready for the Democratic Derek? Would you be ready for the Derek, uh, the Democratic Party militia? <laughs> uh, I'd be fascinated to see what collection of. Uh, Rand Corporation research assistants they put together for something like that. Damn. Speaking as a former <laughs> Rand Corporation research assistant, uh, Ooh, I would oh, I would whoa. be fascinated. Oh you yeah, many years ago, deep state, deep state credentials there, buddy. Whoa, whoa yeah. <laughs> that's right. See, I mean, I was part of the military know, industrial I'm complex, in but God yeah. damn. <laughs> like uh, pa pa Pascal has all these like deep state operatives around him. It's like it's all Pascal's handlers, you know. <laughs> He's too hot to handle, so he, so they have to send Marcus, you know, just in case, like just in case, just in case, you know, he needs to, you know, be silenced. Once you start getting too popular, with Pascal, I'm sorry, got to put you down. <laughs> yeah, and then Marcus, Marcus no, no, <laughs> The Mau Mau will happen one way or the other. The Karen militia is is uh, between Anglo pessimism and the Karen militia. I think Daniel and Derek need to write the greatest Jacobin article ever about the Karen militia and, and Anglo pessimism. But it really tells you something that like you can't like you can envisage a, like a Republican Party militia, like people who would go and like murder people for the Republican Party. Like not everybody, but there are people. But you just can't imagine anyone like ride or die for the Democrat Republicans Party. Imagine Antifa or some kind of Black Panther organization in that role, but it's entirely fanciful, right? The like, closest it, the Republicans are going to get to that is Black Panther Two and all of the uh, electric boogaloo. Like, I mean, that's black, like, black, black people that go there in dashikis. That's going to be as close. But as that on January sixth, though, like they did murder a cop. You know, like that was. Who was all you know? Like you got a QAnon group of fucking psychos that murdered a cop who was also a QAnon psycho. You know, like <laughs> like these motherfuckers are ready to go. <laughs> See, I think I I disagree with that. I mean, I think one of the major preconditions of, of fascism was that military experience, and I think the irony is that by basically ensuring that there's been generations of Americans who haven't fought wars, which is unique in world history, there's really no fear of um, any sort of organized militia movement. Again, I think you could have stochastic things like the Vegas shooting, uh, the sh shooting in Pittsburgh, the various things like that. But in terms of organized thing, there's no there's no base for a fry corps or an no, iron no, front. If we're gonna no, just I, I, the I, there's not a mass base. But there are veterans from Iraq, from yeah. Afghanistan, and right now they a lot of them become contractors. But the ones that go home, um, that is a small, it's a very small segment of the population. But they are people who have that training, have that esprit, have that mentality, and often have that politics.
And because I don't think there's enough pushing, basically. It's quite, that, that may very well be. But also, the fact that there's contractor jobs for them is a really big difference. If the Fry Corps could have just gotten six-figure salaries uh, putting down natives in Namibia, then you wouldn't right. have had to deal with them in the streets of Berlin. So what about the Oath Keepers? There's a there's an Oath Keeper. I, I stay out here by the beach currently, and um, there is an Oath Keeper RV, and uh, there's all this crazy shit written all over their RV. And one of the th and I want to take a picture of it so bad, but I'm afraid if I take a picture, they're gonna shoot me. But one of the things on the RV it says BLM, Biden loves minors. Oh wow! <laughs> um, I think the Oath like Keepers call, probably, like coal I miners. <laughs> I think the Oath Keepers are much more dangerous than the, uh, what is it, Boogaloo Boys, the Bad Boys, what do they call the... Uh, the Boogaloo think, Boys, the, 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 those guys, it's just like... Who are guys that, who's the guys that Trump sh uh, shouted out? Uh, Proud Boys. Proud Boys. Yeah, I think, Proud I think Boys. the Oath Keepers, people talk about the, the Proud Boys are a joke. The guys who I think who are seriously dangerous are the Oath Keepers. For, the cops, the former military, it's all, I mean, come on. I think one when, of the concerning things too, though, is that in and someone actually brought it up in chat is is who do some of these, especially like someone like Eric Prince, like where where do his where does his trained militia group, you know, where do the people that he's got connections to, and also has like this person that's access to a fucking arsenal. Well, one like, thing I would agree, one thing I would agree with Daniel on, like like I don't find the like is it fascism or is it not fascism debate. Uh, like very helpful uh, because you know we're dealing with like very specific historical conditions uh, and you know yes there's like a very big difference between America today and Germany in in the early 1930s so whether we call what's happening today fascism post-fascism view fascism or just reactionary right politics is is kind of it's just a semantic game what I do think is the case though is that unlike in Germany the American state does not require a Freikorps to enforce itself. Like the the reactionary right doesn't need these people. They ha they have the they have the police forces. They have the regular uh, th things. You know they don't need that stuff. And America is not like Germany in the sense that you conquer the capital city, you seize power, and then you control the whole uh, country. America is an empire. Things are very dispersed. And I think one of the ways that the reactionary right, to Pascal's point, will will maintain power is not simply through imposing its rule across the entire country, but allowing liberal bastions like New York, California, uh, uh, Washington State to, to, to exist. You can still get abortions. You can still have blue hair, but by, but but taking a tight grip on national pro politics and, and enforcing a very reactionary agenda across the country. They don't need jackasses like the fucking Oath Keepers causing, uh, causing trouble from them as they are consolidating power. I think the, the 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 sin, the reason that some Republicans were pissed off about the January 6th was like, we don't need these motherfuckers. Like, we'll just make the next election through perfectly legal judicial yeah. means. I got news for you. I got news for you. Let me tell you right now. If people think they're going to be safe in New York or the Northeast or the California, I got news for you. The New Jersey gubernatorial election. Don't believe it. The cops right now in New York are now saying I'm anti-vax, I'm anti-vax mandate. All right. What I'm saying is that the reaction, the notion that the reactionary right is only going to be a southern red state phenomenon, I think people are deluded with that. Because there are a lot of urban white ethics in New York, in New Jersey, in in in, in Rhode Island, who got no problem with Trump. And by the way, they're gonna be a lot of black and brown people who might be like, I hate this vax stuff. Or for other reasons, tied to the Democrats, they didn't hook us up, they didn't give us what we want, or we'll just stay home. And you might see a Republican take over a state like New York. If he can well, take over New Jersey, why can't he take over New York? It's it's work. pretty it's pretty Trumpy where I'm at here in California. Yeah, I, I'm I'm agreeing with you. Listen, Jason, let's think about this. Let's be for real, for real. Cal Blue California, Blue California was literally just trembling because that right wing negro clown was possibly going to be governor well i think there's like like that's there's issues though like where 
I think most of the Democratic Party, I think like, yeah, like even like, so like going into 2020, 2022, and like the Democrats just are, are fucking ineffectual, uh, paid opposition, shitty at politics, you know, choose, choose your are reasoning. They? Well, and I mean, I think it just you know, like depends on the location well, and, and well, what size. Well, that, well, what I'm saying though is that like these, some of this, some of the things as far as like moving forward, I think you are going to end up with an expansion of left politics with an overall decrease of the democratic uh, political structure. You know, the only thing the Democrats are good at. You know what? The only thing the Democrats are good at because that's their job. You know what it is? Can I tell you what it is? Crushing the left. Yeah. India, India Walton. Uh, uh, Nina Turner, the progressives in the progressives that all the, the, the Jacobin DSA types said we're going to change the world got cut, got all of their sexual genitalia cut. Oh, with this infrastructure. Oh, that's very, that's very happy. I think yeah. the most important structural thing about the Democratic Party now is the class of consultants who essentially get a ton mm -hmm. of money to uh, run races that they're guaranteed to lose. That really only exists on the Democratic side. And I think Damn. that's the most important structural transformation um, the party's experienced in the last 30 years. And I think barring some like gigantic structural change that'll continue and it's just basically it's hard for me to get totally. up around because we've just totally lost so much that's i'm all about hashtag content now that's that you know shoot me up with heroin and, and put me in the, the car with the <laughs> pedal to the metal into the brick wall of climate change what, because one I reason see, yeah i don't see any anything changing without some sort of structural transformation which i think is essentially impossible i mean the lincoln project was the transfer of those consultants from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. Yeah. What do you think, Derek? Are yeah, we doomed? Uh, well, I think, I think, um, I mean, I think, I think you guys are both right. I think that the better way to think about the Democratic Party institutionally, um, rather than thinking of it as a political party whose objective is to win elections, it's, uh, it, it's a think tank and a media funnel, basically. It, it's a way to take donor money and distribute it to, to media consultants. And it's a place for, uh, you know, 25, 30 year old um, kind of suburban and, and you know, uh, urban to some extent, uh, well off <laughs> nerds to, to, to go find work. Um, at the same time, I do think the structures of a political party exist within the democratic institution. And I, I say that because they snap to, to incredible effect anytime it, it, the party needs to kind of put down a left uh, insurgency or a left uprising or, or kind of smack down any, any movement left. So I think, I think the muscles are still there, but they don't get exercised. This is, I've been saying for years, the function and purpose of the democratic party is to neutralize any politics to its left to coalesce with the right period and the the, the thing is like i don't think there's any real disagreement in there there i think the thing is though is that and when we were talking about even like the congressional progressive caucus holding up the bill for this uh for the build back better agenda it's the first time in decades any coalition left of center held up any type of processes what did that get us like literally nothing <laughs> like at this point it literally got them nothing but that's the, that's uh, just recognizing that hey this is a point of something that had happened in the for the first time in a long time you know and where is and I, that's what i think is like 2022 democrats are going to get absolutely demolished overall i could see an increase in like the quote-unquote squad um within that shrinking democratic structure um but that's the thing is like this is largely driving to what i think i agree with pascal is that the republican party dominates and it, what's funny what the reaction it, to that hopefully could be yeah a resurgence of the left but you know stay tuned look man the third republicans like, are friendlier to aoc and squad type uh progressives leftists them what you will than uh, the democratic establishment because the republicans find them extraordinarily useful foils um sure. but the democrats would prefer to extirpate them and not just well, that but like you look at the local the, you look at local democratic party and i'll tell you from springfield it is and i've said this before it's like boomer like feminists 
uh, their doctor partners. Uh, and whenever anyone tries to run, they will wheel out like people on the verge of death to vote mm -hmm. for their thing, to maintain their control over it. It's like, and all the, and it's a therapy group. It's a therapy group for these professional managerial classes on a local level to feel morally superior to the hoi polloi and the reactionary elements in their, you know, of the local gentry. Like you have this professional managerial elite of university professors and doctors living in small town America who despise the business elite, that uh, the, the rapacious business elite that runs the small towns. And then they never want to win power. They just sit there and hold on to the apparatus uh, of the Democratic Party. But number two, and I'll push back on Pascal's point, I do not believe the Republican Party is actually capable of doing this social democracy po politics. I think they can adopt some of the rhetoric, uh, but I think that libertarian brain melt is so yep. fucking powerful yep. amongst the American right compared to where you have national conservatives in Europe like the Tories or Orban who will do this kind of stuff. I think the ideological hegemony of libertarian absolute capitalist nonsense will mean that this populist social democratic uh, uh, stuff that they say will only ever be a rhetorical flourish. Maybe they'll give you money to keep your wife at home. First Beyond step that, but, but uh, beyond that, I don't think I don't think we can. I don't think the American right is capable of doing those kind of politics. Yep, you get you get the and, first step back. Would right. they, unless Romney unless Romney takes over the party, like that is no, like, I, I, a I, Romney I politics. Hold on, let, let Cuba let Cuba answer. Let Cuba answer. What about um, the Republicans printing money, giving it to uh, large employers like Walmart, McDonald's, you name it, and paying them to basically insert their own uh, labor force, giving them that kind of like basic uh, social democratic package at the cost of severe curtailment of, uh, of freedom by employers, which is already part of the Republican playbook. What do you think, Derek? Um, I mean, I think that's an interesting possibility. There, there are ways to get around um you, you know discontent and and i think uh that could be one of the trade-offs that gets made you sort of uh let's say trade the 15 dollars minimum wage for you know you get to to have a company store and and kind of insert yourself in the lives of your workers um i i was thinking we need uh, uh we need bismarck to like come back from the dead and take over the republican party uh i, got, I, I mean because he got it i mean he got this sort of the need for a safety valve to kind of uh, I have a you know, give people a standard of living uh, that 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 avoids unrest or at least minimizes it. I have a rebuttal to Gene's position, and this is why I disagree with it. How how effective were the libertarians at stopping Trump from giving people two thousand dollars? They were not. They couldn't do it. I'm no, saying it, it, it depends. It depends. I don't think they cared that. No, I don't because, think they cared yeah, that much. Yeah, yeah. They, they don't care. But I think no, 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 like, no. your argument is that their ide ideologically certain things are beyond the pale for them. That that goes against their ideology. Pascal, what I'm saying is that Pascal. hold on, yes. let me tell you, Pascal. Let me tell you, you have been interrupting everybody all day. Let me tell you, first step act okay. is what you get from the Republicans. That's not social democracy. That's rhetoric, and it does nothing for the the disproportionate amount of black and brown people that are locked up in prison. It has done nothing. And that was trumpeted as this great piece of legislation that was going to change the way we look at incarceration. So, gotcha. And a two thousand dollar, a two thousand dollar bribe, a two thousand dollar bribe is not the same as making some kind of like long term policy. Like I just, I just, I, th I think they might be willing to like do an emergency measure, like dump them dump some cash in the economy but to do any kind of structural change i think is beyond them because i i think i think the 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 power of this like capitalist ideology in, in america is so powerful on the right that it 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 it, it stymies their ability to go fully national conservative i heard another rebuttal quote from adolf reed we got more from Nixon than any Democratic president that came after him. Why did we get more from Nixon? Come on, man. Context. 
Yeah, this was movements this, pushing him to do all that. He didn't wake up one day and say, "This is a they, great they idea." All, they, but 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 he did it to preserve the order of society. So did, in a cold war, in a cold war context where the New Deal uh, coalition was still my viable. position is this: in order to preserve the order of society, the reactionary right would do it. I, I'm skeptical that they have the ideological infrastructure I, to do it. Well. It's not just ideological, but that state has also been hollowed out. So if you want to have an ambitious uh, program, if it's going to be administered through the state and not through predatory contractors, you're going to have to hire more um, cadres. You're going to have to uh, train up and, and make uh, bureaucracies that the Republicans despise uh, effective. Maybe do you can they... do that, but... Um, I think you go through the contractors and they steal everything and ruin the program and make it ineffective. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, and I like I think that's you see that with like the PVP is like exactly what uh Cuba is talking about. This like huge bill that's supposed to give money to small businesses. It goes through for profit banking structures, uh, where most small businesses don't have a relationship with, and then most of the money goes into, you know, huge corporations. Well, I could have I could... a ton of small businesses, you know. Um, but I would say, you know, like that's that's where too of like right now you've got the joy in you know, not encouraging, but willing to do some stuff on postal banking, you know, that's like I don't know. I, I it's possible that like I but I like highly unlikely because like Romney well, if Romney was like the the ideological strength in the Republican Party, I could you know see that happening a whole lot more. But uh, yeah, the libertarian brain rot is is. Got I, 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 let me make another rebuttal if you, if you will indulge me. Yeah, Barack Obama was proposing at a point in his presidency to cut Social Security. This was a major, major, major initiative that he was going to go through. Remember, remember, do you remember people remember when that was on the table that he wanted yeah. to do? I remember when it was on the table Grand with Bush Jr. I mean, right. I remember and, when it was on the table with Reagan. I okay, literally remember that. They, they were Republicans. Do you know what stopped Barack Obama from being able to cut Social Security? The Republicans. The Republicans, not the Democrats. That doesn't so mean the Republicans are gonna. That doesn't mean the Republicans are gonna implement social democracy, even in a crisis. I mean, I don't know. I'm just very skeptical about their ability to overcome the uh, overcome like the hegemony of kind of libertarian capitalist ideas on the right. Like uh, Marcus, I have a friend uh, who works in a bank and who told me like the PPI, like people were just stealing that money. Like it's like yeah. if you knew how to game the system, he, he was like they, they were like, don't even check things properly. Just fucking loot the thing. So there'll be opportunity like Pascal. I agree. They the 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 right will give opportunities for like the the like the small town american bourgeoisie uh the people who dress in camo hats but live in mac mansions give opportunities for them to like loot state assets and state money but like any kind of meaningful sustained program i don't think they're capable of doing it because beyond maybe just maybe giving money to keep women at home and That's and i'll say yeah, to, to that point too is that the largely the person that was building the ppp program was susan collins who like romney represents a type of republican that is like dying quickly um and so yeah i mean yeah i don't know and i, I like mean, i think that like they they might attempt to but it would be a complete and utter like privatizing failure. social security actually goes into your whole point pascal about a 50-year counter-revolution because the privatization of social security has been a talking point kind of sort of on a bipartisan level for some time so bringing up barack obama to me means nothing because bush jr was talking about it and definitely reagan talked about it as well so my question reagan is what is your security. fucking point reagan saved social security that's a fact he, he saved, social saved social security okay how do you save social security because he actually extend extended the capacity to pay into the program Mm -hmm. to actually disperse payments do the check it out okay. look at reagan's amendments to social security in the 80s that's a fact no one can deny that. Okay. What do our guests think? The Prestige Boys. In terms of, like... in terms of the whether the Republican Party will go national conservative. Yeah. Um. I mean, just looking at the history, this has been like a uniquely anti-natalist country. 
So there's not much to build on historically about where that would come from. And also that the sort of federalism gets into it. Um, and and I think that the problem with, that the Republicans have is that they don't want black or brown people to essentially get the benefits of those sorts of policies. So maybe something like that could happen at a state level. Um, and then they could structure it in such a way where the quote unquote right people are having babies. But a pro-natalist policy um, that could result in you know um more um ethnic minority white genocide white genocide Just call it what it is Whiskey yeah it gravy yeah it doesn't seem like that would um be a, a a policy that republicans could embrace at least at the national level well um one possibility thinking of my own experience working in washington the one part of the federal bureaucratic apparatus that republicans like is the DB and uh, Homeland Security. That was where, putting aside the Department of Defense, that was where Trump poured in a lot of money and that's where you had federal employees that were cadres for Trumpism. So I could imagine potentially building up the Department of Homeland Security even more with an ideological screen and then um, using that to vet who gets benefits. What do you think, Gary? Um, you were going to say something. Um, I mean, I I think uh, one of the, your commenters just put up a, a quote from Milton Friedman, and this is uh, what I was thinking here. I mean, there is a a tradition in libertarian thinking of uh, talking about a universal basic income uh, or negative income tax um, that I, I think could could gain some purchase within the the republican party i I don't know that um i mean it would certainly have to be in exchange for gutting the 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 social welfare system as it exists now um they they wouldn't just add it on to to what exists now and it would it would have to come at a a sort of net loss i think for for the the worst off uh, among us um but i i think it could gain some traction could it actually you know gain enough support within the republican party to become um a, a serious policy proposal i don't know i find the the republican coalition to be um uh, almost as incoherent really if you if you drill into it if you like actually look at who comprises the base of that party i find it to be uh almost as incoherent as the democrats it's just that they're able to organize uh, more effectively, and they have certain core key issues uh, that that seem to draw them uh, together better than the the Democrats are able to do. But I, I, I so I don't know. I think um, if there is going to be a change here, if the Republicans are going to adopt uh, anything along these lines, I think it would be something like that. It would be something like UBI. But I, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't know that that you can. Uh, I actually. That. Can I just piggyback on Derek for a second um, as one white man in- interrupting another white man? Um, I think that um, what what we could see is a UBI because I think the structures of capitalism are pushi- pushing in that direction. Why do I say that? I think the United States has essentially created a globalized system. It stands atop of a hierarchy and it relies on the whole system functioning through its consumption. So if Americans actually begin begin to decrease in their consumptive habits. Some juice needs to be put in the system. And I think Pascal is exactly right. Uh, you see that through quantitative easing. And so I think that actually that a, a recession like 2008 and 2009 is not possible anymore because that was based on real decline in real estate values. I think the system, whether consciously or not, um, would now just pump money through uh, the, th- the entire thing to make sure that doesn't happen. I think that's what we've seen precisely in COVID, where the stock market has gone up in real Real estate prices have gone up, which is really insane. So I think there's now a total disconnection from the um, a, a real material economy. But however, this whole thing is still premised on American consumption. So you could get a UBI if if you know the powers that be or the algorithm which has become conscious essentially needs to juice consumption. So something like that is possible. In my and, I mean, you could actually attach it to an antinatalist. Uh, policy package and make it a kind of um, narcotized, um, sedated euthanization of um, the uh, surplus population. Oh man! And like, also, I, 
I was gonna say with, with the UBI, like, like the reason why even like Andrew Yang and it's like building popularity is that even within like the libertarian like sphere, the idea that like utilizing this as a more efficient way of doing um, like welfare, having you know like a security state, um, that's uh, that's kind of like. I think from their understanding, even built in of like, hey, this is how we get rid of um, some of the government apparatus that we don't like. Um, and then at that point, it's just turn, waiting to dwindle and then eventually turn off the UBI. Oh God, I just had, I had the, I had the vision now where they say you can have money, but then if you have that money given to Amazon, you get more Amazon credits to buy things. Oh, or yeah. you get or you get or you get money for your Steam account so you can get more video a games. Firm. What do you yeah, guys think around firm? Yeah, like you get they, they give you a UBI off like Amazon food delivery, DoorDash. You get DoorDash food delivery and uh Steam Steam video game account money. No, yeah, no, so like you get you get a hundred bucks you, in UBI, but you can purchase like 150 bucks of DoorDash credit or something. Yeah, exactly. That oh, would be Pascal. You that can is, put that all is deeply the grim. You want. I'm going to actually keep putting quotes up because I understand the bipartisan bill that happened with Tip O'Neill, but I'm going to keep putting this up because it's it's backing up my point. So I will win every time. No, not on this argument. Yeah, I'm winning every time. Uh, put put up every put time up to that because that's Tip O'Neill. That's not Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was the president. That's, wouldn't have that's, a, uh, uh, that's a Democratic House and Senate. It was a, exactly. And it was very, a very powerful at the time. And wow. yeah, you don't want to. You don't want to. You don't want to. Well, yeah, it uh, is I just think, Pascal beef. Yeah, I think there may have been because they don't want mommy and daddy to fight. I think there's a way that you can both be right. Um, where um, there's a, a very strong democratic appetite for that kind of grand bargain, where you got the. Um, Social, uh, Social Security and Medicare in order to pay off, you know, reduce deficits, reduce expenditures. And the Republicans are willing to entertain it if they think that um, the Democrats will get most of the dirt on them. But if Republicans are in charge, they either propose something like George W. Bush, where it's like, you'll get to keep your Social Security, but we're just going to pour it through um, hedge funds and um, money managers um, in the in the stock market. Uh, or you have somebody like Trump that's just willing to weaponize it for electoral advantage because they always know that the Democrats are going to come back to it when they're in, uh, in their, they're in power. God, this is a gloomy day, day today. It's always a gloomy day when Daniel Baston is in the house. It's been gloomy a hundred years. <laughs> ever since, uh, part, ever since, ever since it, Cuba's people. It feels people, like a normal day for me. Uh, <laughs> the, it's the it, definitely the black pill person off the uh, TIR crew. Um, I mean, I just call it a pill. I don't see color like that. Look, Pascal, <laughs> Pascal is admitting to everybody that he's pro Reagan. I, I, I'll tell you one thing. Bill Clinton did more damage to America than Ronald Reagan did, period. See? I don't see uh, in some sense, I, I, Clinton finished the project, yeah, I think. He yeah, didn't yeah, have yeah. to. He didn't the, have to. No, 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 for sure. But they're part of the same historical constellation. Absolutely. And Bill yeah. Clinton implemented it worse and did more damage to black people. Yeah, because it was further on. He could do he could do worse. Reagan still had to deal with people who like remembered the New Deal in a way that Clinton could just be like, fuck it, we won the Cold War. Let's go all the way. Damn. Yeah. It's a brutal, yeah. it's a brutal time. And we're still living, we're still living with the consequences of all the socialist parties, not stopping the first world war. Yeah, well, that's really true, man. I, the more I think about it, that was the chance. Once the workers of Europe fought themselves, that was it. Yep. Once they mowed each other down, like we had the opportunity when they all played football on the, you know, <laughs> in, in, uh, in, on Christmas day, 1914. And then that was the opportunity for revolution and it was gone. Okay. That's On a cheery note, uh, yeah. we've been going for almost two hours now, and we fadangled more time out of uh, Bessner that, than I think he thought he was going to give. And Derek, that was the quickest two. No, hours the, the well, what happened was Daniel was pimping out Derek. He was like, "Look, I'm only going to give you 25 minutes." But uh, <laughs> yeah, I saw that. I know. I, I woke up sick, but uh, I took a, a like three day quill, so I'm I'm riding high right now. Is that yeah, what we're yeah, calling it nowadays? Day quill. 
<laughs> yeah, this, well, is the la- this is the last TIR episode. That's what they're calling it nowadays. <laughs> from <laughs> the States, everybody. The last okay. one being broadcast from the States. Starting next or, week, yeah. we'll be broadcasting down south. We'll have full NAFTA representation. Full NAFTA. Yeah, full NAFTA. Full NAFTA. Full NAFTA. Pascal is very pro uh, Reagan. I'm very pro Clinton. So. I'm not pro Reagan. I'll be very. Let me be very honest. Pascal, stop. stop. Just hug him. Go hug. Go go to. Listen, I think I, he's I buried down to listen, San Diego. Listen, okay. I want to say this. I listen. I'm not a fan of Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was the president of my high school and college years. I will tell you this, the, and this is true. There are a lot of black people from my age who went to college who had that Cosby mentality. <laughs> Though they believe Reagan was a racist, a lot of those Negroes were like, I'm glad Carter didn't win. That's why you had Ebony Magazine articles in 87 talking about the new black middle class. Are you in or are you out? So yeah. all these Negroes are going like, oh, I hated Reagan. Reagan was a racist. Reagan had these more stable expansion of the black middle class in America in the post-civil rights era. That's a fact. What about Clinton? Clinton was all based on a subprime mortgage crisis. I, yeah, and, 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 yeah, that's why I would I would push and back. The dot, and the dot-com bubble. Yeah. His jobs were lower paying and not the same quality, and it didn't have the deep impact as Reagan's expansion of the black middle class. I would have to look at that to see because I would... I had, I had this debate with, on social media with Lester Spence. I don't give a Lester. damn about Lester Spence. Give okay. a goddamn about it. I said it online. Give a goddamn. Oh, damn. Um, I, 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 say, I do want to say, though, this is actually seems to be a really nice guy. People shouldn't have a gloomy day. Remember <laughs> that the bipartisan infrastructure, it's finally infrastructure week, y'all. Come on. <laughs> come on. But I hope I hope Derek and Daniel will come back. And you guys should have called your show D&D. One of you could be the dungeon and D&D. one of you could be the dragon. <laughs> or a double dose of this pimpin. Yeah. That, that, I mean, we get we can get kinky, but that sounds a little kinkier than we usually get on the show. So I don't know. We get, but we'd love to have you back at some point for this uh, for for more black pill talk. Of course, we, yeah. We definitely yeah, we're happy to come and bring our gloom uh, gloomy cloud to other people's shows for sure. If you could just halt the white on white violence uh, next time, though, just yeah. it's not something. White people can't hear. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. The, I'm sorry. Hey, hey, hey. I, I'll have you know it's poll on Jew violence okay. and third on, on Biden violence. And according to the rule book, when you are going to interrupt someone, you have to say point of privilege, point of privilege. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you respond with the Kamala. I'm speaking. I'm speaking. <laughs> no, you need to do the thing for the, the th- I saw a Google thing where they have like, uh, I think they do it for the visually impaired, actually, where they go like, hello, I am a white Caucasian man with a beard. And, uh, and, uh. And, oh yeah, I saw that. You should yeah, just say podcast Twitter. host. Yeah. Damn. Yeah, exactly. Oh, damn. <laughs> oh. Oh, spicy. Got him. We all do. You have... guys are hella mean. Okay. Jason's not a white Caucasian man with a beard. <sighs> he doesn't play metal music. You forgot we said this earlier today. We have to have the white people on so we can get a better listener base because whenever black people are speaking. They think we're talking about black people only shit or sports. We have great we have great numbers with shows when we have black people speaking. Yeah, because they all think it's a sports show and then they get mad when they find out it's not about the NBA. <laughs> like you guys aren't gonna talk about Kanye? There's no Kanye talk? Have you been doing like focus group stuff on this? <laughs> yeah. 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 If you want to know where the Patreon money's going. Why do you think? Why do you, why do you think of comments. Guys, the Lincoln Project to break down the audience for him? You guys are going <laughs> to hell. Okay, okay, we gotta go. We gotta go. It's late. Daniel's gotta go take a bunch of Nyquil. Now Eric I'm being accused. Now I'm accused of being both a Stalinist and a Reagan fan. This is incredible. <laughs> Pascal, by the time this is all Reagan, said, they were big you will be Stalin Reagan. Reagan. Yeah. You will be Stalin Reagan. Yeah. You're going to be Stalin Reagan. You're going to be a black Alex P. Keaton. You should write the book. The book, you know, uh, Stalin Reaganism, you know, the new ideology. It's actually kind of funny. If you write a book called Stalin and Reagan is my (laughs) N-words, and if those two write a book about Anglo- Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You're going to get a cabinet-level position in the next Trump administration. (laughs) Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> yes. If you can, if if these very intelligent guys can do this Andy Kaufman level fucking joke uh, slash grift, we would all be so rich. I just want you to know that. That's how you make money in podcasting. <laughs> no, the way you like make money in podcasting is is Jason Miles does a right wing pivot and talks about talks about uh, he becomes the new uh, Candace Owens. No, no. shirtless Jason reads the news. Yes, yeah. <laughs> in the hot tub, Jason mm-hmm. OnlyFans. Mm-hmm. All right, yeah, we are going to do shows from this from the Mexico deck though. In a so, hot tub, hot tub streams. On that note, it's time for cartoons. I love y'all.